Uh, it just wasn't true for me. And so yeah. I think that when you get to advice and it, it goes for literally everything I've said here today, um, you have to kind of evaluate it and go, okay, well that worked for Chris, but maybe that wouldn't work for me because of these yeah. reasons, you know, just think about it a little bit. And especially if somebody's like giving you advice that will define your entire career, maybe just like, you know, get a second opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Um, would be a good idea. But other than that, I would just say, um, you know, not to sweat the small stuff. Sussy vowing, growing in and knowing, wisdom is flowing. If you didn't know, now you know. Welcome to another episode of the No Degree Podcast. I want to personally thank you for tuning in and supporting our show. If you haven't yet, hit that follow or subscribe button. I encourage you. Don't keep this to yourself. Share these inspiring stories with your friends. Invite them to subscribe and connect with us on social media. So today, I have Chris Pridemore, who has a wealth of experience within the technology space. And you really worked your way up. So what do you do? So currently, uh, I'm a a senior security engineer uh, for Anderson Corporation, which is the largest uh, windows and door manufacturer in the United States. Oh, so it's those windows, the Anderson windows. Yeah, yeah the ones you might have in your house. You know, you know what? I didn't even realize, like, sometimes you, you see that people work at companies, they're just like, oh, those those windows. Yeah, we're huge. Now, what does a senior security engineer do? Um, So my day-to-day, um, I, I kind of split myself into two disciplines. So um, I work in what's called the GRC, which is um, governance, risk, and compliance uh, for our security team. And so my day-to-day is half of it I spend talking with um, like systems infrastructure teams, developers, our cloud team, and just helping them develop solutions that are secure. You know, they'll come with me with a project and I'll say, well, you know, you can improve this area or this area over here doesn't really, you know, meet guidelines for, for security requirements and just kind of help guide them through that. The other side is I do threat modeling um, and risk management. And so there I, I kind of lead a, a small team of people that uh, essentially then analyze either solutions or vendors or or customers or kind of anything and just determine what the risk is for the business. And then we compare that against like the business's appetite for risk and determine whether or not it's it's within that or not. It's kind of like the business gives me a box and I try to put all the solutions in a box. And if it doesn't fit, I either figure out a way to make it fit in the box or I tell somebody and then they accept that it doesn't fit in the box. <laughs> you know, it's kind of the easiest, easiest way to explain it. Now that that's pretty cool. So if you could create like a blueprint of your success that you could pass on to someone without a college degree, what would it look like? What should they do? What shouldn't they do? You know, I, I think probably the number one element for my success was that I'm very passionate about my field. Um, you know, especially when it comes to IT, it's really less about less about credentials or degrees, like those can help you maybe kind of get a foot in the door. But at the end of the day, the people that you see get promoted, the people that you see advance their career and go on to do interesting things are the people who are really passionate, interested, who, you know, are going to learn outside. I, you know, I have like a ridiculous home lab set up. I have a server rack in my basement. If I wasn't working in IT, I'd be doing this stuff anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I find that the passion just makes it so much easier to compete because the fact is in a technology career, you're going to have to learn, right? Technology, yep. when you first started, is completely different than it is now, right? There's different solutions. There's newer technologies. I remember when, probably when we grew up, SaaS wasn't really a thing, right? No. You buy a piece of software once, now it's a SaaS model. So it's a totally different model and all that. And you have to stay up to date on, okay, what yeah, is the difference exactly. between those models? How does that change, right? You just can't compete in technology. Because the fact is, someone's going to know really quickly that you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and and to be honest, um, you know, some of the best IT people I've ever personally known either didn't have a diploma or had or had degrees in like really weird stuff you wouldn't expect. Like when I worked at Hayes Companies, we had this really excellent systems admin who uh, his bachelor's was in sports medicine. <laughs> But he yeah. was he was just really passionate about technology and, and systems and stuff. So it, it ended up working out just fine for him. And, you know, the other thing is I, I tell people and it's not like you have to be so passionate that all you that's all you do. But you do have to like yeah. it. 
right? Because the fact is, it's like after a day of work, you have to spend a little time like learning or at work, you have to be really proactive. Yes. Because the fact is, it's like sometimes you have to figure out what the solution is and it's not easily found online or you have to talk to someone, you have to bounce ideas, especially for new areas. You have to know based on your current knowledge how it's going to apply to your organization. Because I've seen so many people like they'll get into programming, they'll get into IT. And it's just because it's the hot job. They yep. hear of these things that pay a lot of money. And what ends up happening is maybe they might do it for a year or two or they move to something else. Or the fact is they could never hack it in because they don't want to do the extra work because they just don't like yeah. it. And and I can tell you that um, early on in my career when I was working at lower level positions, especially at help desk, you'd have, you know, some of the older time, old timers would come up and say, oh, well, you love, you love the technology now, but it's fine. You'll grow out of it. Okay, well, the reason that you're... 40 years old and still working tier one help desk is because you grew out of it, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, as yeah. you go up, you find, you actually find people who are even more invested in like the technology side and stuff. And you, you find all kinds of little, little niche things, you know, like you may be talking to, you know, like one of our data analysts and like, Oh, he's like really into like home IOT stuff. And then you can have like a whole conversation. Yeah. Everybody's got something, something about technology yeah. that they're like really into. You know, it's interesting. I'm working with someone on their resume right now. He had he got like an injection of a chip so he can open his Tesla door with it, the garage sure. door. And it's like, pro- and then if you put your phone on it, if it's an iPhone, it'll go to your LinkedIn. It'll go to his LinkedIn profile and all that. So he can program it. And it's just interesting. And, you know, he's built PCs and all that. And I find that people who do well in technology, they have some hobbies that incorporate technology because they genuinely care. Right. They have yeah. that builder's mindset. I think he was very into motorcycles and he knew how to repair it in and out. But it's the same thing. You're you're thinking about a computer. You think about what all the components do and how they interact. And if they fail, how can you diagnose it? Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if you want me to get into like my history or yet anything, but no, um, go ahead. Let's let's start. Let's go into your I know, history. Uh, I think early in my career, I kind of got paralyzed by that. You know, uh, if you if you make your hobby a job, then it stops becoming a hobby. Like that kind of paralyzed me a bit because I actually, I didn't start in IT. I, I joined the military when I was 17. Um, I was an intelligence analyst in the army and um, I got out, I got hurt. They decided they didn't want me around anymore. And um, even at that time, I, I was, I was way into building computers. I'd been building computers since I was like single digits age. And um, yeah, uh, I was actually like, <laughs> This is going to sound so niche. Um, so I was actually like a top ranked overclocker in the world for a while. Uh, like top oh, 100. Dude, overclocking <laughs> is, is is serious. Uh, this was back in the like mid to mid mid uh, 2000s, early 2010s. Um, yeah, I was like top 100 on HWBot, which is the site that tracks it. Uh, you get points for like yeah. having the highest overclocker, having the best benchmark score for like yeah. certain pieces of hardware. Um, I wasn't in IT. <laughs> I hadn't, I hadn't actually made it. I wouldn't make it into it till like several years later. Um, even though I was already like really into that stuff. Cause I was kind of concerned that if I made it my day job, it just wouldn't be interesting, but no, no, it did. It worked. I loved it. I loved it then. I loved it. Now I'll keep loving it into the future. You went or you mentioned something when we were talking before that you would go around the house and take things apart and all that. Oh yeah. When I was a kid, um, yeah, I've taken, I took apart everything. Actually, when, um, uh, I've always been really good at like fixing stuff. Um, when I was, uh, six, I actually fixed my first television. Um, I actually, okay. my, uh, uh, <laughs> such a weird story. Um, my grandfather, uh, found me this old black and white TV. Um, and it was, it was broken and he helped me go like, get the manual to figure out what was wrong with it. And it turned out it was like one of the tubes was, it was really old. It was really old. It was black and white. Right. Um, uh, and then I, I, I went, we went to radio shack. We got the replacement part. I put it in, fixed the TV. And that was great because I wanted to watch some shows and I could never watch my shows. Cause they were the same time as, as whatever, something my parents were watching. And, um, and it was cool. Cause then I had a TV in my room. <laughs> Wow. That, that And that's cool. And I, I think like as a technologist having, you know, just building, right? I find a lot of people in technology, they're builders, right? Like they want to build. They're like, this is cool. How can I do it myself? Or, hey, here's this crazy thing. How do I do like a do-it-yourself version that's not industrial, that's not like production level, but it can still 
do a lot. So what were some of the earlier jobs you've had? So let's see when I, uh, so my parents didn't let me have a job when I was a kid. Uh, my dad, my dad had worked when he was a kid and his dad had worked like when they were 13. Yeah. So he didn't want any of his kids to work uh, when they were teenagers. So I used to do like odd jobs and stuff. Like we used to live near the fairgrounds. Uh, well, I'll just say I grew up in, near the fairgrounds in Des Moines, Iowa. I don't live there anymore. But um, and during the fair time, which is like 10 days, because the Iowa fair is a big deal. Uh, I would like go out and like buy like sodas and snacks and stuff and then like sell them because we were only like two blocks away from the gate. And I'd make a killing. Yeah, you know, you pay 15 cents for a soda and you sell it for a dollar or whatever. That actually sounds like a bargain today, but it wasn't then. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, that kind of stuff. I actually delivered newspapers for a long time, too, like when I was a kid. Uh, but but as like an adult, um, the first job I ever actually had, I managed a GameStop. That was the first job I ever had. Um, that was kind of cool. Um, until it wasn't, (laughs) there's a, you know, what's, what's interesting. I find that you get some really technical people at GameStop, right? Cause you have this hobby and you get to at least work with games. Right. And a lot of technical people tend to be into gaming. I liked that part. I I didn't like the part where I had to like fire people and write a schedule. (laughs) Yeah. Um, no, it was, it's actually funny because, um, the store that I worked at, we got so many applications to work at the store. We had like a stack that we kept underneath the, and there's just so many, we never looked at them. There was like, there was like 200 applications underneath that, the, the main, the main bench there. But, um, yeah, it was kind of funny. It, it was, it was good. And then, you know, I think the advantage there is you get people who are passionate, but you get so many people who want to work there. You actually get pretty good employees, but the pay isn't very good. But you do get a discount. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, you do get a discount. I do, I do know it can be a little tough because I know a lot of people have to push the warranties and they have like metrics. On yeah, it, it wasn't, and all it that. wasn't as bad when I was in or when I was doing it. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I think it ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's been worse. Sometimes it hasn't been as bad. I, I, I still, I still uh, patronize the the local uh, GameStop here, and I talk to the guy about like all the nonsense that's going on. So yeah, because I know like when I buy a Switch game, they'll be like, "Oh, do you want a warranty for like two bucks?" I was like, "I've never had a Switch game fail, and if it fails, I probably have played it too much, and I should stop playing it." Hundred percent of the Switch game problems I have are my daughter loses them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that warranty doesn't cover that. Um, yeah, and then. Uh, that's all. Uh, I actually, after that, and I, I'd kind of gotten out of the military. I actually tried to go to college. Yeah. Uh, it didn't work out. Turns out you have to actually go to, to the class <laughs> to get grades. How long were you in the military and what'd you learn? Well, I was in for six years. Um, what I learned. Wow. That's such a broad question. I learned all kinds of stuff. Uh, I learned different ways to kill people. I mean, in a very real sense. Um, <laughs> But I mean, if you mean like from a growth perspective, discipline, I think is probably the number one thing for me. I, I think the big one, the, the two biggest ones for me that I probably still use today is we have this phrase in the military and it's called embrace the suck. And it's basically the idea yeah. that you come to terms with just being in an awful situation and just let go and give into it. Um, that's super useful all the time. Just being able to just yeah. accept where I'm at and what's going on. Um, the other one is kind of just uh, being cool, being able to make decisions under a situation that's like super stressful. I guess the way that, you know, I, I put it in terms of the corporate world is there's nothing in the corporate world. That's probably going to be as stressful as like making a decision that could get someone killed. So yeah, nothing really matters that much, <laughs> you know? So um I mean, that's that's probably the biggest stuff for me. Now, how was it getting out and the transition? Because I know the transition can be tough, right? It's like some military jobs are very specific or people don't know how to translate it to the civilian world. So once you got out, what was your next yeah, step? Yeah, so I, I tried to continue my career as an intelligence analyst because there are civilian opportunities, but all of them are working for either the government or a contracting agency that's contracting to the government. Um, so I ran into a lot of roadblocks. Um Number one, they all wanted me to move to Washington, D.C., <laughs> and uh, I wasn't super interested in that. Um, and then uh, a lot of them also wanted a diploma, even even if you had been in and, and done it. I mean, I even had a top secret clearance. I couldn't even really get anybody to call me back. Kind of not the greatest transition for me, especially since 
Um, I, I'd injured my back and I was actually like laid up yeah. for months. Um, and it was really hard for me to just move around and do things. It's still kind of difficult for me to do certain things. Like I used to be a long distance runner. I can't really run anymore. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, eventually I just had to kind of take any job I could get. Um, so I did a stint at GameStop. Um, I actually worked on a loading dock as a forklift operator for a while. <laughs> With that back? Well, because I could sit in the forklift. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> um, and uh, also, Aleve does wonders. <laughs> yeah, I, I hated that job. I actually was working third shift. I think I told you about that one before. It was my my dad yeah. is a truck driver, and I got a job at his his company, and I lasted a few months working uh, like nine to seven, I think, with the hours at night. Yeah, nine nine p.m. to the seven a.m. Yeah, the day I quit, he was super happy about it. <laughs> oh, he was so he uh, he wanted me to go do something else that wasn't uh, physical. So yeah, all right. So you quit. What what came next? Um, I got offered a job working at a tech bench actually at Staples, Easy Tech. Okay, fixing viruses and whatever random nonsense people got up to on their computers. Plus, it was a sales job, so I had to sell stuff. Um, and I had to sell stuff with that stuff. So what kind of things would you sell? Like software, computer? Yeah, so the, the way they worked, they had this system called baskets. So if you sold like a primary device, so like a laptop or like a printer or something, um, every dollar of stuff you sold with that, even if it was like grabbing a bag of M&Ms as they went to checkout, yeah. went towards your monthly bonus. And okay. then you, your bonus would be based on what your basket value was. Okay, so what was your strategy? You you tell them you they should buy some M and M's with the printer. I was honest. I like that. So I my my strategy my started slow. So my strategy would be like they're you know parents buying their kids a laptop for school, and that very common, right? That was probably most of our laptop yeah. sales. And uh, you know they'd be like, oh, we got to buy a copy of Office, which is like three hundred dollars. I'm like, no, don't buy this. You can buy it for fifty dollars at the school bookstore, and then I save them two hundred fifty dollars, and then they'll trust anything you say after that. <laughs> um, you know, and then if it's like, hey, you know, I would buy this because this is like a really good mouse or whatever else they need. Um, worked out, worked out pretty well. Um, I just, I didn't, I, I just didn't, I didn't want to do it scummy. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is why I'd, I couldn't get the job at Best Buy because I told the sales manager I wouldn't sell somebody something if I didn't think they actually needed it. <laughs> I've seen it at Best Buy where it's like, hey, we'll give you this gold plated HDMI, HDMI or yeah. like this super SD card. It's like, dude, I'm going to buy it on Amazon but the th for like a third The thing device. about being honest with people is that they will keep coming back to you. So, you know, maybe, maybe I didn't make as much as I could have on that sale, but then when those parents need to replace their computer, they'll come back and talk to me about it. Right. And then they'll keep, yeah. they'll keep coming back because you're on, you're straight with them every time. So, you know, I think that's a big thing. Um, I actually learned a lot of sales techniques and I like, I like to call it psychological manipulation. My wife hates it when I say it like that. Um, but you know, honestly, the way that you survive in like corporate environments or yeah. enterprise is you psychological manipulate people. <laughs> that's 100% yeah. what it's about. Um, and that's like, you know, the, the, the meta part of like your job, even if it's technical, you know, you still have to interact with people. Um, and you know, that's super important. Yeah. I mean, you have to, because you have to like set boundaries, you have to set expectations, you have to be realistic, uh, you know, cause a lot of people say, Hey, say yes to everything. And you know, the advice is I'll oh, come early, leave late. And it's like, and then you'll get to whatever position you want. And then sometimes they may be like, they don't want to promote you because if they promote you, they don't have you anymore. And it can get very complex. So you have to find that right balance of doing a good job, but also setting your boundaries, knowing how to interact with different personalities. Because some people you do yes to and they'll, they'll love you. And other people, they'll see it as a sign of weakness and they'll take advantage of you. So you have to really understand how to navigate the corporate landscape. So how long did you have that job at Staples? Uh, let's see, I worked there like six months. Okay. Employee of the month twice. <laughs> okay. 33% rate. That's serious. Um, and then um, I had this uh, recruiter from Robert Half show up one day. She was having her computer serviced, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, when we were done, she's like, here's my card. I don't think you should be working here. And then like the next week I had an interview for um, like an enterprise IT job. And then I, I got it. Wow. So 
Now, how was it getting that first job? And I could imagine it was a significant pay bump. Um, yeah, I think I went from like twelve dollars an hour to like sixteen, which is that's pretty. Okay. That's like thirty a thirty three percent. You know. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it was it was like a um, it was a hospital. It was a six month contract. They were doing a refresh from Windows XP to Windows Seven because I'm old. Okay. Yeah, I may have lied a little. Yeah. You know, they go, hey, if you use these kind of printers. Well, so I knew how to use, I knew printers because I worked at Staples and Staples is big on printers. So that helped. And then um, they'd be like, yeah, have you ever used this software? Never heard of. Oh, yeah, all the time. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. Figure it out. Figure it out when you get there. Um, I'm, I'm a big fake it till you make it person. You just got to make sure that you can follow up <laughs> with. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the thing with technology is like you go online, you go on forums, you read the manuals, and it's like if you work with one printer, you kind of understand. Okay, here here's the same things, and here are the differences. So you have that six month contract. How like how was it? Because there were some things you didn't know. How'd you pick up on it? Um, it was really cool. I think um a couple of the more knowledgeable guys figured out like right away that I was full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was cool. But you know, they sat down. They were like you know, teach me how to do stuff. Um, and then uh, I actually ended up kind of lucking out because we, we had this issue with like updates and I managed to solve the problem that we were having that was like slowing down our deployment um, just by like, um, I took like one of the computers home and I'm like, I'm going to build this and turn it into an update server. And they're like, okay, whatever. And I like, I spent like the whole weekend, like just trying to figure out how like the Windows update server worked um, and I, I had it configured. I brought it in. We put it down. It like doubled our, our deployment times. Um, and that was pretty cool. And then I got on, on the recruiter's good list. Yeah. Which I guess is a thing. <laughs> you don't want to end up on the bad list. Yeah. Who knows what happens to people on the bad list? Okay. So you had the six month contract. What came next? Um, another contract. And then I was working for a traditional department actually in Des Moines. That was like a year long contract. Again, I think I was helping them with like a deployment. So Iowa's weird. Iowa has um, 99 counties, which is like a lot of counties for a state that's not all that big. And each county has a courthouse. So I'd have to like drive out to like every single county to do like this hardware refresh, um, which which was, I don't know, it paid pretty well. It paid better than my first gig. Um and uh, that was pretty fun. I learned a lot about that, too. And then, yeah, I think when that one dried up, uh, I actually went, like, on a six-month stint without being able to find work. Oh, wow. Yeah, like, I really wanted not contract work. Like, I really wanted to just work at a place. Yeah. And um, it actually ended up forcing me to leave Des Moines just because I couldn't find work. <laughs> and um, I, had, uh, I had some family up here. I live in the Twin Cities now. I've had some family up in the Twin Cities, moved up here, and I haven't had a single day of uh, involuntary unemployment since. Wow. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, okay, that's cool. So now, what was your like next big gig? That was like wow, like I got into a big company. So the company that I actually came up for um, was a contract to hire, and right at the end of my contract, they had layoffs, and so I was there for like a month. Oh man. Um and so I immediately I, I was like the day I was supposed to go sign for like our our apartment and I had gotten laid off. And um I remember like the, the IT manager was super bummed about it. He's like, You should you should still like sign your lease. Like you're gonna it's gonna be way easier to find work here than it is where you're yeah. from. Um and then like the next day my recruiter got me an interview at General Mills and okay. they called me that night and offered me the job. And that one ended up that one ended up being like an 18 month contract to work on their help desk. And that was cool because it was like the first like, you know, that's like a hundred fifty thousand person company, right? Yeah, so yeah. that was like that was like big leagues IT. Um that was fun. I learned I learned a whole bunch there. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it was just another contract gig. Uh and so the contract comes to an end. They don't hire you, they don't hire you, right? Yeah. So um but then after that, I, I got I got my first full time IT job. Um, I actually it was like a friend of a friend, not through the recruiter, got me an interview uh, with a manager at IBM um, and they were looking for somebody to do like remote systems administrator um, in the area. And so like the problem, the problem with trying to move from like help desk to systems admin is like nobody wants to let just 
some help desk person go configure their servers. <laughs> you know, you have to kind of already have server experience to go do that. And it's hard to get server experience if nobody will hire you. So it's like kind of this weird catch 22. And so I got the interview and I figured that's all I need. And my brother and I, who were um, living together at the time, um, we had went and found this server rack on Craigslist for this company that was like downsizing. They got yeah. rid of it. We rented a U-Haul, brought the server rack home, and then started buying servers off eBay. <laughs> and um, so we had a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, in there, we were like hosting websites like for a couple friends and like one nonprofit that was in the area that we were kind of involved in and just some other stuff. And so when we when I did the call with the um, lady from IBM, you know, we're doing like a video call and I'm like, oh, yeah, let me show you my server rack that's just in my kitchen. And I showed it to them and they, they like offered me the job like right on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Craigslist and eBay. What a de- that's a dangerous combo. Yeah. Well, now I guess it would be like Facebook Marketplace and yeah. probably still eBay. Yeah. So, something like or Facebook Marketplace and Facebook, right? Just like, yeah. Um, okay, cool. So now how was it? Now you had your first corporate role. Like how was the transition? Like what were some things that were hard? So I worked I worked for the IBM like uh, managed services, so like MSP, that stands for Managed Service Provider, and it's basically a company that provides IT services to companies that maybe don't have them in house. And so, a lot of what IBM does is they like will lease their systems, yeah, and then they also lease the support. So, for instance, one of my clients is AT and T. So, AT and T uses all IBM systems and all their data centers, and so I'd be the guy on site to go manage them and make sure that they're like operating fine. Um, and so the problem with working for an MSP is that they make you account for your time in six minute increments. Wow. Because that's one tenth of an hour. <laughs> and so I would have to put like the exact amount of like six minute increments that I spent like doing every single task. And I almost felt like sometimes it took longer to like sit there and like, yeah, you know, put all that in than it did to at- do any of the work. Plus, this was like the early 2000s. And for some reason, they were still using Blackberries. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that, that was, that was probably the worst part, but it got me tons of exposure. So that was really my first time using Linux. Um, cause obviously they're responsible for Red Hat Linux and my daily driver computer was Linux and that was pretty cool. And I got experienced all kinds of cool server technologies, hardware, um, you know, different kinds of systems. And yeah, it was great until um, I got put into a data center, uh, an AT&T data center. I was just babysitting their servers and I didn't have my nearest coworker was in like Chicago and there was nobody else there. It was just me. It was the most boring job I've ever had. And it was miserable just because I didn't ever see anybody. Yeah. Um, And I'm kind of a social person. So I need, I need some human interaction. Um, but the, you know, at the time they said that if I wanted to move up or go do something else, I'd have to move to like Rochester, Minnesota, which if you don't know, is not in the Twin Cities. <laughs> it is to the south. Um, and uh, I didn't want to do that. So I ended up I ended up on a hunt uh, for a new position uh, that would, you know, allow me the opportunity. And so I went from um, like 150,000 employees to like 200,000 employees. And then my next job was 80. <laughs> um, and I got I got this job at a, a company called Parametric as a as a systems administrator. I think they called it a well, I was senior solutions technician or whatever the hell that means. Um, and uh, yeah, that was terrible. Um, it was a really small company. They had um, a culture, and it was hard to like penetrate into like you know the general. It was very it was like. They would, they had uh, alcohol after four every day and like they would, they would bring like masseuses in. They had like a um, uh, omelet bar, like every Sounds Friday like a morning. Fake Google. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so they were, they were a, a brokerage firm okay. and um, so just a couple stories about like the amount of money. So they, as a company, they made something like $650,000 per employee. Like yeah. that was their profit per employee. Which is insane. That's yeah. an insane level of, of per, per yeah. employee income. Um, but I, I remember uh, I flew out to Seattle to go to the headquarters, and they uh, my per diem for dinner was two hundred and fifty dollars. Oh my god! 
just for dinner. And that included, because that included alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't drink. So yeah. I was, I was never, I was never going to hit that. I tried. I really tried. Never even got close. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that was it was kind of a a lot. They put me up in like these crazy expensive hotels, which actually really sucked because I had to pay for it and they were going to reimburse me. Oh, okay. but this hotel they had picked out in Seattle and this was the early 2010s and it was like $600 a night or something stupid like that. That would be expensive now. And I had to pay for it. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, holy shit, I'm about to like max out my credit card, yeah. like paying for this trip. <laughs> um and that was that was pretty terrible. Uh, I didn't have a lot of money back then. Yeah. No, I mean, look, it's tough. Like a lot of people don't realize like as you're moving up and you're coming from these jobs and like technology, especially on the IT side, yeah. it's not necessarily you make a lot of money. It takes time. Well, I think I was, I think working help desk at that point, I was making like maybe $22 an hour or something, yeah. um, which at the time was like a seasoned help desk person. Um, and then the job parametric was my first um, like salary position. I think it was like $60,000 even. That was, that was a lot. That was a lot. That was a big bump to me at the time. Yeah. That was also the first job I ever got fired from. Okay. <laughs> only, only job I've ever been fired from. Um, cause Dolan was technically a layoff. Okay. Yeah. It's actually funny. Oh, how the, tell you mind sharing the story. Oh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going into it. Um, yeah. So I wasn't happy there and it was kind of just a bad fit. And then like I was unhappy and that reflected in my work. Right. I wasn't happy doing what I, cause what had happened is the on site IT team only had four people. Yeah. Um, but one quit, I was supposed to come in and replace them. But then as I got there, the other guy quit. And so it was just me and the manager, but those were like the two like help desk guys. And then, so now I was doing all the server stuff and all the help desk stuff. I was working like 70 hours a week. They wouldn't hire another guy. And it was miserable and I got fired and I felt so good about it. Like in, in the firing meeting, I felt terrible. But then by the time I got home, I was like, this is awesome. I'm so glad I don't work there anymore. And it's actually funny because the guy that fired me, not only wrote me an excellent reference at the time. Um, but he also, we reconnected recently and like cleared the air and we're totally chill with each other. He's like, he's like, I want to, I want to bring you in on a project or something. And (laughs) anyway, it's kind of crazy. That's that's cool because I think that really shows that a good manager, he realized it wasn't the good fit for you, but just because it wasn't a good fit for you, yeah. that didn't mean that you're not good at other things and that didn't mean that. So that, that that's really cool. So you got fired. Now, what what was your next job and what were you looking for? Um, So I guess more systems administration type work, but like not doing help desk at all. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up getting it. I ended up working at this insurance broker called Hayes companies, which was acquired recently and doesn't exist anymore. Um, but that was, that was actually excellent. I stayed there for six years, which was my longest tenure since the military. Um, I, I, I worked as a systems administrator, um, slash like integration analyst kind of thing. And then eventually, um, I was doing systems engineering work. Um, cause we, the, there's left and I was like, I can do what he was doing. That's fine. And then they let me do it. And then I did a great job doing that. And then uh, we needed a security team. And so they tapped me to build out our first security team. And so it kind of started out as I was doing both jobs. And then eventually it was full-time security. And then we hired a whole team of people. And by the time I left, it was like four people on our security team. And it was it was pretty cool. Now, how'd you go about learning security? <sighs> so when I was at Parametric, I actually told uh, my manager at the time that I wanted to... Uh, learn security. Like that was, that was what I was interested in. And yeah, uh, I had started studying then I just started like following security blogs and, and going through like, honestly, like white papers and stuff like, Oh, this exploits weird. Like how does this exploit work? How does that function? You know, stuff like that. Just trying to learn how these people exploit systems. Um, And honestly, when I was a kid, I'd been a little bit into it, right? Like, um, you probably don't know this, but there used to be a website called Hack This Site. It may still exist. I don't even know. Um, I'll actually check it right now. But yeah, you could go on there and like you literally you get a prize if you like hack them. But it's got a bunch of tutorials on how to do things like SQL injection or stuff like just like really basic, like kind of how to. So I'd always been a little interested, interested in it. Um, But yeah, honestly, a lot of it was just okay. They want me to build this. Well, let's go look and see the best way that 
people build these, like what's the standard industry practice? Look it up, research it, figure it out. Okay, we're going to implement it this way. Or, well, that won't work because, you know, our environment's like this. So maybe either we tweak it or we go find something else. Um, I mean, some experimentation, but honestly, just having somebody who gave me the latitude to be able to just experiment, try things and just like learn a new technology was kind of instrumental. And at this point, I still I still didn't have a diploma. I've never received a single IT certification. <laughs> wow. I mean, that that's cool. It's um I check I was checking out hack the site it still exists it looks like it's in like a website from that was very cool in the 2000s um they have like um there's other there's like um hack the box okay and there's there's other like versions now try hack me try hack me is try hack one. me yeah. is a very That's modern like one that hack the box is free and it has a lot and it and it's serious like the 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 routes are like 30 to 60 to even 100 hours. So it's like security is one of those areas that you can seriously learn a lot and, you know, move up and you can break into enterprise. And again, they always need good security people. So you had that for six years. Now, why did you want to move? Like, what was your reasoning and what were you looking for your next position? Yeah, so um, once I, so so Hayes, I kind of out, outgrew it. There was nowhere really to go from from where I was. It was a small IT team, you know, 20 people at its yeah. best. Um, but then we got acquired. So we were a private company. And then we got acquired by a publicly traded company. And my whole world came crashing down. Yeah. And actually, the worst part about it is I think part of the reason we got acquired is because I helped them get socked too. <laughs> ah, so you're, you caused your own... <laughs> Yeah, so we got acquired. Things started changing. They basically said that if I wanted to stay on the security team, I'd have to move to Daytona Beach, Florida. And even even then, that was a non-starter. Now it's like really a non-starter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so I just you know decided, okay, well, let's go look for something bigger and better, and see if I can't do more interesting things. The same thing, but bigger. Yeah. So now you yeah, you finally got to Anderson. So now it's been yeah. close to two years at Anderson you end up being a secu- senior security engineer. How was it at this bigger company? It was, it was so, and, and I don't know if this is just cause I've reached a certain level of seniority or if, if um, it's just the culture, the very first meeting I ever had where I walked in and I was given like technical expertise on something. They listened to me, they took my technical advice and they went, okay, let's do it that way. And it was the first time in my career. I never had to fight anybody. Wow. I'm like, this is how it should be done. Let's do it this way. And that's been my whole career. Like, I'll just, somebody asked me for my opinion and I give it. And then it's either, you know, we talk about it or we go, okay, yeah, that works. Let's do it that way. And it's, uh, it's actually been fantastic. I actually messaged one of my friends who still worked at Hayes um, after that meeting. I could probably find the text or something, but I was like, wow. So I just, I just walked into this meeting and, and said all this stuff and they just went, okay. And now we're doing it. <laughs> And he was shocked because that's not how it worked at Hayes. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, look, cult- cultures change and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Now, let's look back at your career, right? Well, actually, before we go to that, you're at the point where they really respect you and they really trust you. How does growth look like in this phase of your career? Because growth in the earlier phase is just learning the ropes, yeah. learning more technology and that. Now it's a little different, right? Now you're kind of doing leadership things while still being technical and you just have to have a different skill set now. Yeah. So it's, it's like, you know, like those old guys that took me under their wing, my first gig, it's, it's, I'm doing that now I'm taking people and saying, okay, these are the skills you should train or here, help me teach you how to do this. And, um, I, I, I kind of think of it about this, you know, that interview question, everybody always gets answered. Every interview is where do you see yourself in five years? Um, and I've, I've had to answer that question you know, whatever, a hundred times, uh, in interviews. And I think, you know, back just before now in my career, the answer was always something like, well, I work on a help desk now. I'd love to be a systems admin or I'm a sys admin. Now I'd love to be a systems engineer or yeah. I'm a systems engineer, but I really love to work in security. Um, and I don't think I would give an answer like that anymore. I think that if somebody were to ask me that question today, the answer would be something more like, um, I, I want to be working on projects that have like high impact or that are interesting or new or novel or some kind of new technology that people don't really have any interaction with, or I want to help build like an entire environment or program or something. It's, it's really less about like, 
like the titles and like vague job descriptions and more like, I just want to build something and then I can look back and say, I built all that stuff and it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, it's kind of just like a different, it's a shift in perspective a little bit. And sometimes, sometimes building something cool means you spent, you know, $3 million and, and put this neat system together that does interesting things. And sometimes it means that you built a team from scratch and now it's staffed by four people who are fully trained and they don't need me anymore. I can go on and do something else. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that is, that is freaking cool. So now let's, let's look back at your career. What are some of the mistakes you've made that looking back, you're like, all right, you know what? I should have handled that differently. Oh, that's a good question. Um, I started out like really trusting of like companies that I was working for. I think, um, I know I fell into like one of the traps that contractors always fall in, And it's that if a company says they're going to though, Oh, just stay contract. We'll hire you eventually. It's always a lie. It's always a lie. <laughs> it's always a lie. Um, you know, some of the other stuff is, uh, if you, if you work contract, it's really hard to get hired full time. Um, and so I think that was probably one of the early mistakes. Like I may have, I may have tried harder to get like a full-time position instead, just because I don't know. It's like, you've got a weird mark on you where yeah. HR looks at you and goes, oh, I don't want to hire HR people. And I've actually, I've actually been in conversations, you know, cause we do hiring. We yeah. had, we just hired for uh, like a mid-level security analyst. And there were a couple people that were like, they had a lot of contract and yeah. my boss was like, Ooh, I don't think I want to hire them because they, they'll just leave. And it's like, no, like they might just be contract because like everyone thinks like you yeah, and yeah. nobody will hire them. Um, and it's, so it's just like trying to come in and, and maybe, I don't know, speak up for like people, not myself, but like where I was um, and kind of advocate for people. But yeah, I think just always make sure that you're doing what's best for you. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put a lot of stock. Most companies don't care about you. Yeah. And I know that's probably you your know, manager whatever. may care, but even then yeah, your, your manager, manager care. your manager, people around you. But even then, sometimes your manager is handicapped. Like, Hey, we're slashing budgets. Yeah. You're a, you're a fairly large, uh, debit line item on, on a, on a yearly income sheet. So if they can cut you, they will. Yeah. You know, one thing that I tell people who are contractors to get hired, what I what I tell them is you have to network with people in other departments because your current department will be like, hey, OK, yeah, they'll kind of feed you the thing. Whereas the other people and they kind of see you, they're like, all right, I know this person. I've seen their work. But again, it's something different. You can't just rely on that one person. You have to build bridges and connections at other parts of the company so that those people are like, hey, I want to hire Chris. He knows his stuff. and his contract's coming to end. Let's just make the transition easy instead of going through the traditional application process. And it's 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 so important. I know people say whatever networking is important. No, it is. It is even more important than all the platitudes say that it is. Yeah. Because for instance, I only got that job at IBM because a friend of a friend asked for a favor and yeah. they interviewed me. And if I if I hadn't got that job, I don't know where I'd be because that job honestly got me other jobs. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, it's so important to go out and just talk to people and get to know other people in your industry. Like, uh, you know, when I worked at Permetric, we had like VMware user group where you can go out and you can meet other IT people and stuff that that are kind of working in the same area as you are. Go talk to them, you know, add them on LinkedIn, communicate with them, go to those sessions, like just communicate with people, add them to your network because you never know how much that stuff might pay off in the future. And you know what? It pays off in like mysterious ways. Just like oh, you're yeah. talking to your first, the guy that fired you. And it's yeah. just, just because you kept a good relationship, he knew you were a good guy. You knew that, okay, hey, it wasn't a good fit. You didn't take it personally. It came out and who knows where it's going to lead in the future. So now the other thing is how has the just technology industry changed over time in terms of work? Right now mm. things are very different because back then when you learned security, like you freaking bought a server rack. <laughs> auto thing and you did that now there's probably a youtube video of someone like you well, who's installing it it's it's so easy too um because you don't have to buy a server rack anymore you can just go on amazon and get like free like s3 instances or i don't know azure's probably got something equivalent yeah and you can just you can just experiment with things for free in somebody else's infrastructure it's it's so cool like what you can do um but also it's 
the way technology is changing, like a lot of people think it's different, like especially when we get down to like talk about like Kubernetes and Docker and stuff, but it's not really different if you think about it from like a really yeah. um, like holistic approach. So here, for instance, um, so if you, if you think about that efficiency is all about reducing redundancy, right? Yeah. So if we think about it, like the very top level, uh, a data center. Okay. So like a company could own their own data center, but they have a lot of space that they're probably not using. And there's, you know, they already built all this power infrastructure and this network infrastructure. So somebody else could share it. And then we do that and it's called a colo, co-location, yeah. right? And so like, you know, CenturyLink has a data center and then they put a bunch of other companies inside of it. Yeah. Because then they share staff in the building and power and whatever, right? Yeah. And so that's more efficient. And then, you know, we get to um, like down to like servers that are inside the server racks and it became really inefficient to host a, like a website on a server, right? Cause the website takes like nothing to run and a server has lots of resources. So then we started virtualizing them. Right. So we basically took this like underlying hardware layer. We virtualized it and reduced the redundancy of hardware by virtualizing that hardware and then allowing you to run a bunch of operating systems on top of it. And then we did the same thing. We thought, well, every single server in here is running the same kernel right? The same kernel operating system and they all use these same services. So why don't we just containerize or, you know, Docker the, all the stuff that matters, like the web service and all the, the files that are related to it in the configuration. And then underneath it uses the same operating system, which is how Kubernetes Docker works. Yeah. So it's kind of weird, like just thinking about how even out to the physical building, like this whole progress that we've made down, it, it makes sense. Yeah. It's, it's all, I don't know what the next one is, honestly, um, after you get to that, because we've kind of reached a point where I don't know that there's a lot of other redundant stuff we can take away. You know away. what? I personally think it's going to go back the other way, right? I think from think a security so? perspective, right? If you really think about, okay, you have like the, you know, the Amazons, the Google, the Microsoft, they host cloud. But if you really think from a true cybersecurity perspective, I do think there's going to be some, and it's going to be niche, right? But it's going to be niche demand for people having more control over their data, right? Because that's kind of where you get yeah. the Web3 aspect where it's like, hey, we, companies have too much control. Let's have more user-based control. So it's, it, it gets like, I find that just technology and people's mindsets goes through cycles of convenience and security yeah. and convenience and security. You do still see some of that, right? You know, um, when we're talking to vendors and we're doing risk assessments, one of the questions we always ask is, you know, is the data logically or physically separated? And, you know, when we're dealing with like the really important data, we always want to make sure there's a physical separation. Like it's on different yeah. physical hardware because that's important to us uh, when it yeah. comes to security. But I don't know. I think convenience probably wins because it's more expensive. Yeah. It's more expensive and most companies aren't going to want to pay the difference just to be secure. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. I, I think you're right. Convenience uh, does go a long way. So looking back at your career, what would you say is the hardest period that you went through? Probably, probably when I was unemployed and couldn't find any work or even any contracts. That was pretty rough. Kind of makes you feel pretty un unvalued. Yeah. Like, you know, going months and months and months, you can't even get anybody to call you back. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and how do you stay sane? And like, how do you keep yourself going during that time? I was married. That helped. Okay. <laughs> uh, my wife is pretty excellent. Um, I don't know. So I think, again, it comes down to social connections. <laughs> Just different kind. Yeah. And having a good wife always does wonders. So, you know, the uh, well, well, so the other thing, too, about that is, is, um, you know, I always see that as kind of like a period that you can improve yourself. Um, you know, like maybe, maybe that's go learn a new language or maybe that's like, you know, oh, I want like, you know, to go learn more about AWS. And sometimes for people that could be, I'm going to go get an AWS cert or something. It's yeah. not the path I've chosen, but it's totally valid. And it helps demonstrate that you went out of your way to learn it. But I would say use that time that you get it doesn't seem like it, but it's a blessing in a, in one way, right? And that it's you get a lot of time for like self improvement. And I know there's somebody out there who's like been looking for a job for a year and hates me that I said it, but yeah, um, you will eventually find work. You will eventually find something, and you will have appreciated making valuable use of that time because it's not often that you get to dedicate time to yourself and your own self improvement. Yeah. It, it, it's so true because when you're working and then you have obligations outside, it's like having that time, it, it, you can do a lot with it. So now, what are you most proud of in your career? Like looking back, 
what am I most proud of? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty proud of my military service unless we're talking about just it stuff. No, I mean, that's that you learned a lot and you, you know, you served a country. So, so I was, I was deployed to Iraq from 2007, 2008. And, um, I think, I think my most proud moment was doing like humanitarian aid missions. Yeah. Um, which is like giving out school supplies and stuff to like school kids. Obligatory cat. Okay. Um, hey, hey, look, it's not a true podcast unless the cat comes. <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was that was probably um, it. If I had to pick like an IT one, like a technical one, um, when I worked at Parametric, we spent several million dollars and built a true high availability system. That was nice. pretty neat because everybody's like high availability. Well, no, if you want to build high availability, it's really simple. You just figure out what you need to run the system, and then you buy four of it. I like that. And then and then you ship two of them to a different part of the country. <laughs> um and I had a company that actually did it. We we bought four of it and then we shipped two of them to data centers on a different part of the country and we actually set up a truly high availability system. Never went down. Wow, that is that is a serious accomplishment. Now, you've had many different jobs. Was there ever a time the lack of a college degree held you back? I mean, it it, it would be hard to quantify. I would say that there's definitely probably some recruiters or some HR people that didn't call me back. I never know that, but you know, to be honest, what helped me more than a college diploma was just going where the jobs were. Yeah. You know, there were no jobs where I was, I went to a place that had jobs and then it became a lot less of a problem for me. Yeah. No, I think that's important. I think a lot of people have to like consider it because if, um, and also if you're going to do a move, I always tell people look up, jobs in that area and see because there are some areas that care more about javascript some areas that yep. focus on because you have one company that focuses on that and it ends up being a hub so make sure you understand what that local area that you want to move to uh demands what are the market demands in that local yeah. area when i i'd say too I, I know you have a lot of negative opinions i, I think recruiters can be a tool especially yeah. early in your career um the one thing to keep in mind is uh, you should understand how they get paid yeah. Um, and you should you should understand, you know, uh, what they get out of it and what their incentives are. Right. So obviously it's good for you. It's really good for them and it's good for the company. But if you understand everybody's motivations, then it'll be yeah. a lot harder for them to take advantage of you or yeah. get you to do something that you shouldn't do. And also just ask for more money. Yeah. <laughs> All Simple the time. Advice. However much you have in your head right now that you think you're going to ask for. You know, if we're talking hourly, add a few dollars. If we're talking salaried, add 10%. Just ask yeah. for more. <laughs> All the Look, time. Look, it goes a long way. And you know what? I think a lot of the issues that people have with recruiters is they don't understand what recruiters go through and they don't understand their job functions. And I think part of that is recruiters need to be a little more transparent, but it's also good for you to know, right? Like, what does a recruiter do? The recruiter has to help a company find a qualified candidate. So if you're a qualified candidate, just like your cat, you'll, the recruiter will help you. But if you're not qualified, because here's the other thing I've seen, like I'm in, a, in some recruiter group chats and they were like, they have an open to work banner and candidates will literally message them like, hey, is your company hiring? I'm looking for X, Y, Z. And it really shows like candidates not taking the time to understand what the recruiter does. And same thing. It's like, look up the recruiter, look up their company. If you hit up a sales recruiter, they're going to be like, okay, I'm going to have to forward you. I'm, and for large companies, they may not even know who recruits in technology. Yeah. It may be a totally different department. So you, I tell people, understand what recruiters go through, understand what they do. Um, and again, advocate for yourself. Just realize the recruiter is sometimes advocating for you, sometimes advocating more on the company, but know what you do. And it's again, understand that it's a business transaction. Yep. And that there are people involved and know what you bring to the table. And if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, you know, no hard feelings. But sometimes that recruiter may move to another company and you may deal with that recruiter in the in a different environment. And and the other thing too is know your rights, like under the yeah. Labor Act. Yeah. <laughs> uh go read them. Um and, and one of the other things I'll say is like, don't people people tend to be really nervous about like financial stuff. Yeah. Um, don't. It's weird. It's weird. And honestly, that's a that's tool companies use to keep wages low to try to convince you that it's dumb and you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Um, I think openness is important. I've actually we I've I've had I've had coworkers before um, where they'll come to me and ask and I'll tell them, 
And then they go, Oh, I'm getting paid so much less. And I was like, all right, let's go get you paid then. Let's let's figure out, let's let's build a portfolio for you to go in and get a raise so yeah. that you're not getting, you know, so underpaid. It's important. We gotta pull each other up. Yeah. No, I love that. And the other thing that you brought up is like you have to know what your portfolio is because what happens is your boss knows what they do, what you do, but then they have to advocate for you to their boss or whoever hires their budget. They have to convince you. And they may not be able to articulate because you probably do. Look, you're working 40 hours a week. Your boss doesn't know every minute of what you do. So now if you go into it and you're like, hey, I created this high availability system. We have, we've never gone down. We've decreased customer support calls. We've saved X amount of money. Now, if you're like, hey, I saved half a million dollars. Now when the boss goes to advocate for you, hey, Chris has saved half a million dollars. He's asking for a 20K raise. Boom, we do have the budget, right? You know, that's the thing. You look at it, your product, you're selling it to the company, you know, and you get to determine what it's worth to you. And you have to prove that it's worth that extra money if you're going to do that. I'll, I'll give you a good example. We had um, uh, we had this uh, systems administrator who um, was presenting a project. He wanted to do a new, a new project deployment of a new service. And he went into the boss. He spent a lot of time on it, went into the boss, presented it instantly shot down. Nope, we're never doing that. Get out of my office. Took the project away from him, handed it to me. So I opened the proposal. The proposal looked great. I couldn't find any issues with it because he spent a lot of time on it. So I went to him and I was like, I'm just going to resubmit this exactly as you wrote it. Do you want to be in the meeting? And he's like, yeah. And I went in there and I presented the proposal. They didn't even realize it was the same one. They approved it on the spot. And it's like, it's not about the technical details. It's about how you sell it to somebody because it's so important being having that skill, not just for project proposals, but also for yourself. When you ask for a raise, when you ask for a promotion, you are selling something. Look, selling yourself is something you're going to have to do all throughout your life. And if you don't sell it, someone will see that and be like, oh, Chris knows his stuff. He's not selling himself. So there are some people who will be like, look, they're not going to pitch pay you 10000 more. Some people will, but majority of people will realize, hey, I, I want to keep my budgets down and they're going to give you what you say yes to. And if you say yes to it, they're they're going to say, okay, that's what you're worth. But if you ask for more, they can't get away with it, right? Yeah. So now, you know, kind of, this will be a little different. Um, if you saw yourself, 18-year-old Chris, walking, 17-year-old Chris, walking down the street, <laughs> what would you tell him? How much, how much, how many, how can I, how long can I talk to him? You can go, you, can, yeah. <laughs> you, you, got, I, you got like five, you got like three to five minutes. Yeah. I, I think, um, I'd probably just tell him not to be, not to be as afraid of, of like pushing for a career in tech as I was to start with, um, listening to other people. Got to stop listening to other people, Me, myself yeah. included. <laughs> no, but listen to Chris, but not other people. Yeah. 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 Just, just me. Um, I don't know. And and the thing is, I'm sure that I'm sure that some of the advice I got for other people, it's probably true. Uh, It just wasn't true for me. And so I think that when you get to advice and it it goes for literally everything I've said here today, um, you have to kind of evaluate it and go, okay, well, that works for Chris, but maybe that wouldn't work for me because of these reasons, you know, just think about it a little bit. And especially if somebody's like giving you advice that will define your entire career, maybe just like, you know, get a second opinion. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> um, would be a good idea. But other than that, I would just say, um, you know, not to sweat the small stuff. Yeah. And just now, focus on the big picture. Yeah. So now you have a lot of knowledge about salaries. Like what are the realistic salaries for like, you know, the the jobs at like, you know, like a security engineer, people in cybersecurity, systems engineer. What are like the salary ranges for these positions? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it can depend um, pretty heavily on like what kind of company you're working for, how big it is, like what kind of responsibilities you have, just because those titles don't necessarily reflect everything you're doing. But yeah. um, like if you were if you were entry level into um, like security, which for me, an entry level security person is like you've you've done two years in it, like maybe you were help desk, maybe even better. You were like network or systems. Um, I mean that, that should be probably around 70, probably in that 60 to 80 range is where I'd start for those. Um, you get up to systems engineer level. Now you should be looking at hundred plus somewhere in there. I mean, it really kind of depends, like I said, on the size of the company. Um, that's where I would start if I was doing salary negotiations, um, and you know, again, 
we talked about it um, last week with the, I don't know what they call them, the LinkedIn live yeah. stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of resources too, where you can kind of go out and see what like industry averages are um, and things like that. A lot of those tools are pretty good. I find that like Glassdoor seems low yeah, almost Glassdoor, all the time. Do you know what's interesting? I'm going to tell you, <laughs> let's talk about incentives. So Glassdoor is a very interesting case because Glassdoor is a job board. Right. So think about it. As a they want to keep board, their customers happy. They want to keep their customers happy. Yeah. And again, if someone's spending ten, twenty thousand dollars a month on posting job postings and they say, hey, get this review out, get this thing out, it's not accurate. You know, so I'm not saying they absolutely do that, but just realize that you have to look at the incentives. So I, I've heard um better thing, I've heard Glassdoor is one of them, pay scale is also good, and salary.com, and then just networking and yeah. talking to people. I would I and I would say like for glass or add like 10, 20% of okay. everything they say. Um, I've looked, I've looked at security um, uh, like salary ranges on there. And it also depends on your, you know, if you're like in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska, yeah. you're probably not going to make that much <laughs> Yeah, uh, just because there's not a high demand for your skills. But if you live in a major metropolitan area, yeah, you, you get to ask for some money. Yeah. Okay. No, that's good to know. So, uh, yeah. Anything you want to promote before we end the show? Um, no, not really. I know you're you're giving me you're giving me the chance to 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 pitch my own podcast, but I'm not going to do that. Okay. okay. Podcast so, is for me. Okay, that's awesome. So <laughs> I I really appreciate uh just all of your knowledge and your stories is very interesting and realistic. Pat, just real and what I really want to tell people is like the journey is it takes time. You know, you yeah. you've worked on your career over ten years, and you know now you are in a position where you have a lot of opportunity and you make good money. But it it takes time, right? You have to make those mistakes. You have to move up. You have to ask for money along each step of the way because it compounds and take your time. And you have to have that passion shine through. And it's good to see that you're still passionate about what you do. Yeah. Oh, and uh, one last thing before I go, because somebody last the cat's name is Kyber. Okay. So this episode has a special guest, Kyber, who is amazing. So watch the video on YouTube if you haven't watched it. But thank you so much for your time, Chris. This was such a wonderful episode. Yeah, you too. I, I really enjoyed it.